All right, we'll get started. Hi, I'm Greg, uh, CEO of Tech for Campaigns, and thanks for joining uh, our November 2021 uh, virtual all hands. Um, today we have an action packed agenda and excited to bring it to you. Uh, so I'll start with a few minutes of looking back at 2021, um, what we did, what it meant for us um, some in initially, um, and then we'll uh, hand it to Lauren, our campaign director, to talk to Delegate Skyler Van Valkenburg. Uh, one of the recently re-elected uh, delegates from Virginia that we're happy to have uh, join us tonight. Uh, from there, I'll throw it to Amanda, our head of operations, to talk to some of the volunteers who worked so hard on uh, 2021, and then uh, close out with a look at what we are doing um, this upcoming year. So um, first thing I think it's important to say is that the Virginia governor's race caught a lot of headlines. It was, it was a shocker and a disappointment in many ways. Um, but it's also important to look at what happened in New Jersey, and New Jersey wasn't really supposed to be that competitive a race. Um, and when you look, you know, one one uh, graphic caught my eye from 538 that the uh, sort of downturn in many Repo in sort of many Democratic uh, counties in precincts was actually steeper in New Jersey uh, than it was in Virginia. So that both shows it to be sort of a, a little um, small national trend that, that we had happen and also that uh, Virginia was actually um, stronger uh, in the democratic areas which I will uh, attribute without much evidence but a good feeling to the uh, strong campaigning and activity from Schuyler and many of his colleagues. Um, so before I go into Virginia I wanted to talk about something we did do in New Jersey give a little preview. Uh, so we ran a randomized control trial in New Jersey um, an experiment to test different voter targeting techniques on on Facebook. And we went into this thinking it would be uh, somewhat of a scientific endeavor, like it would be great to help the governor in the slate there, um, but we weren't really expecting it to be uh, all that competitive. Um, when we saw the results, we actually realized that we ended up reaching uh, a figure of about half or about half a million people of likely Democratic voters, which is equivalent to 39% of the votes that uh, Phil Murphy got. So uh, we won't know the effect of those ads until the um, first quarter when the voter file comes out, but uh, we are thankful and uh, <laughs> thankful that we did the program um, and excited to see what the results were. So I will go into Virginia with one note. Uh, I'm sure Scott can back up. It was not a landslide. It was it was a heavy result on the governor's race in both New Jersey and Virginia. Uh, it was not a landslide in the Virginia State House. We have many candidates who uh, are likely to have outper outperformed Terry McAuliffe at the top of the ticket. And we have the control of the chamber coming down currently to two races, um, two candidates that we worked with both in 2019 and 2021, who, uh, when I pulled these numbers a couple of days ago, uh, both of them together um, were 221 votes away from, from winning. And that's why they are in, in recounts currently. Uh, a neighboring um, district in delegate, Kelly Fowler, she won by only 344 votes. So, Although the top line results definitely didn't go the way we hoped, the way we um, really wanted in our hearts, we do take solace in that the margins for these races came down to such narrow bands. Um, and these are the kind of uh, differences that programs like ours can make a difference in, whether it's raising money, um, getting out the word on, on voting through social media, branding websites. This is the, the kind of stuff that we do and the kind of margins that we can help um, influence. And so. Uh, although it didn't go uh, the you know ultimately the right way, we do take solace in um, that we are in the right fight uh, through these numbers. So we deployed 139 volunteers uh, this this cycle um, into Virginia. We drafted 739 emails. So thank you for everybody out there who both wrote, uh, scheduled, ch error checked, and those into your tracker. Uh, we served. Um, uh, over 10 million ad impressions with uh, volunteers coming from, you know, the big tech names, but also uh, some some that would surprise you. So it was an awesome effort from the community to, to come out and um, help candidates in the digital needs that they need the most. Our KPI, so we worked 22 campaigns, including the caucus. We uh, accomplished 71 digital projects. So those were the eight week chunks of a website or an email marketing campaign or digital ads raised almost $150,000. We were very close to that to that, um, to that goal. Uh, didn't quite get there, although you know, it might be something we recount too. And um, working with the caucus, we uh, tested a lot of messaging around some of the hot button things that really ended up playing out. Um, 
in this election, like defund the police, critical race theory um, attacks, um, you know, the sort of question of uh, motivating Democrats. And I think that was an impactful um, program as well. We are lucky uh, if you volunteer this year, you probably got an incessant amount of emails asking for feedback. We love it. It's what makes it all go, uh, makes us all ever better every single year. Um, so really take, take heart in um, some of the positive feedback that we've received from many of the candidates, managers, and volunteers that uh, we've worked with, including Skyler's uh, campaign manager over here in, in the corner. So um, this all uh, goes with, with people effort, but technology is really important too. Uh, so one of the things that we've spent the year doing is building out a lot of the data and analytics infrastructure around our programs. So acquiring um, data, providing real-time analysis, and then being able to put those lessons back out into the field. Um, and so on the, both the digital advertising and, and email fronts have been a huge focus of our tech team this year, um, providing you know, details on what kind of emails are doing well, who's raising money um, you know, in, in the right uh, way, whose videos are really catching your eye, and um, what are people talking about? Are they talking about the right things? Or are they talking about enough things? Um, so with that, I hope I did that in as fast but efficient and clear a way as possible to get to the good part. I will hand it to Lauren, our campaign director, to talk to Delegate uh, Van Valkenburg. Perfect. Hi, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Um, thank you so much, Delegate, for joining us tonight. Um, I'm really excited to hear your take on everything. Um, for everyone on the call, um, Skyler got first elected in 2017, has been working with THC, um, and just got reelected. And I'll let you give more of an intro background uh, on yourself there. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, well, first, let me just start before I introduce myself by thanking you guys um, for everything you, you've you done, both uh, this cycle and in 2019, and, and not just for me, but for everybody. Uh, you know, uh, we're, we're like little engines that can, could type of campaigns, you know, it's really like, it's, it's like me, Shannon, and two other people. Uh, and uh, every little bit helps. And, and Greg showed you some of those margins, but since I've been involved in Virginia politics, those have been the margins every year. Uh, and, and those are going to be moving forward the margins because we're a, we're a purple state that I think leans blue, but uh, as, as you could tell from the election can, can swing the other way. And so um, we, we are condemned to close elections determining the fate of Virginia, I think, for the foreseeable future, right, which uh, really means like every little bit helps and matters and counts and gets us across the line. So, so thank you for that. Um, my name is Skyler. I'm a teacher. I teach government in high school um, in Henrico County, which is the county I represent as well. Uh, in the General Assembly. I was first elected in 2017. Uh, when the seat opened up, I was, I was very not happy with what had happened in 16, like probably many of you, and uh, tried to say, you know, okay, I need to practice what I preach. What am I going to do? And, and I wasn't planning on doing this, but one thing led to another, and, and here we are. And, um, you know, it's been, a, it's been a really good ride. And, and you know, uh, Virginia, I think, has been a pretty hopeful story uh, for the country. And, and I've even had people from across the world say they have been heartened by what we're doing. Uh, and we've been able to accomplish a lot. And, you know, uh, now we're going to be in defense and uh, in a defensive posture for the next couple of years. But, like, we've really changed the trajectory of what it, what, like, what this Commonwealth is about and what it represents and, and what it does. And, um, I, I think that's just really exciting. I, I mean, I've been teaching uh, massive resistance and Jim Crow laws since I started teaching, and I got to yank massive resistance from the law code last year myself. Like I, I carried the bill on the House side to take it out because it was still in the law, legal code, you know. And we went from being the uh, second hardest state to vote in to the twelfth easiest in two years. And I mean, and we, I could do the whole list, but that's just like you know things that really resonate with me because of my profession and, and, and I think things we all care about. And so, I don't know, I, I feel like I'm probably going to start to ramble at some point. Um, but they, they did ask me to say, you know, what, what advice do I have for, for moving forward and for, you know, next year and, and people running for office and people who are involved in it. And, you know, I think that I've run three different races now, a race nobody thought I could win. Uh, a race where we were the incumbent and everybody thought we were safe um, and, and then we got slammed um, uh, by, by the opposition and, and attack ads and, and a race this year that I think was really from a position of strength, which was, which was nice. Um, but I think that the, 
they were all different. They all had different strategies. We all have different types of managers. Um, I think the, the one constant is just, you really need two things to win a race. And I just think this is universal. You need a, you need a candidate and a, uh, a candidate that matches their district. And I think has a vision that people see as authentic. And, and I think we have that, um, you know, I'm a teacher in a County where, uh, people move there for education and they care a lot about their schools and um, they care a lot about that. And, uh, and it's just hard work uh, from the staff to the candidate, you know, you know, so Shannon and I all the way down uh, and just, you know, when you don't want to knock those 10 extra doors, knocking those 10 extra doors, you don't want to make those 10 extra phone calls, make them. And I, I, that sounds like cheesy and vague and cliched. Um, but, but, you know, our, some of these races are so close that that work really does matter and it does pay off and people remember um, that you knocked their door or that you, you know, made that extra phone call. And so um, there's a lot of campaigns that don't work hard. Um, and, and I think that, that those two things are the key. Uh, and if you have those two things, you can, you can really, you can win. Um, so, but I'll leave it there because um, I think questions are more fun, so. Great. Well, I'll ask a few questions. And if people want to put questions um, in the chat, feel free to do so there. Um, what would you say your biggest learning during your few, first few years um, in the house, you know, was? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, in some ways, I, I had a built in advantage when I was first running for office, which is I've been teaching and following this stuff for years. And my kind of like, um, my like Carl Rove or David Axelrod type figure is also a government teacher who's been doing this for years and cares a lot about it. And so between the two of us, we, we kind of like, you, you don't know what you're doing until you do it, but like, we kind of knew what was coming. Um, and I think the thing that I, I don't want to say I learned, cause I, I guess I kind of knew it, but the thing that was surprising that and that was constantly being reinforced both on the politics side, running for office, but also on the policy side, getting things done, uh, is it's just politics is such a people business. I mean, part of my French, but if you're an asshole, like it, it, you know, it, it, it people remember. Um, and if you're, if you work with others, and if you you build a tent and you build a coalition, and you're constantly trying to bring people in, and you're not burning bridges, uh, you can get a long way. Uh, and, and I just think it's like, in some ways, it's like the obvious lesson, but it's the thing that's right in front of our faces that are sometimes hardest to see. And so, um, I just think like. I don't want to say I learned it, but I just, that it's just reinforced all the time. Um, and it's something that I think is important to keep in mind um, when, when you're doing this, because it's, yeah, there's issues that are partisan, but there's a whole lot of issues that aren't. And if people like you or can work with you or understand where you're coming from and value where you're coming from, you, you can still get things done and get people to vote for you that wouldn't otherwise vote for you. Uh, yeah, that's really interesting. I think, especially from what we see, you know, so much in the media and how much, you know, it, it seems like people don't get along. It's, it's exciting to hear that there still is that there and that it does help to get legislation passed. Um, since you were first elected, how do you feel like things have changed in terms of communicating like with your constituents? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, in some ways it's completely changed and in some ways it's like the exact same. Um, and, and what I mean by that is like, um, like, I'll just take the campaign since we just got out of it, but like, TV is still to this day the most impactful thing you can do. I, I mean, it's just bananas. I, um, I have never, I never had done positive TV ads and film TV ads until this year because we just never had the resources or we were never really prioritized. And um, having like eight weeks of positive TV ads, like people knew who I was in a way that was like just significantly more than otherwise. Um, and so, like, kind of tried and true methods still are very impactful and door knocking is included in that too. Uh, but then in other ways, like how people consume content is so different. Um, it's so different. And I think that's where the biggest difference is, even since I've gotten in, um, you know, uh, I mean, this, this, is, this is a thing that's been happening for a long time, right? But just like the decay of newspapers and local news and the kind of popping up of of kind of like these pop-up media organizations that are also kind of political organizations or the importance of you know Twitter or something like that um, and so that change is I think mostly a bad one for state legislatures because um, the reality is is that like people just aren't paying attention to us in general so like we kind of get lost out in the swamp of like 
you know, I'm, I, I think I saw that senator from Louisiana's uh, video where he asked that Biden nominee if she, he should call her comrade. I think I saw that like 500 times today. Um, and I think I saw like all Virginia related news on Twitter, like maybe 10 times today. Um, and so like, it's, I think it's really detrimental to us because people see less of us, um, you know, especially if you're not a kind of crazy person who's going out of their way to say crazy things. Um, so that that's a that's a challenge for us, I think, with how we communicate. But the kind of tried and true stuff is still is still still works and it's still impactful, um, whether it's direct, like shaking a hand at the door or it's uh, TV. Got it. Um, exciting to hear those things still still work. Um, I guess since we are on a TFC call with our TFC volunteers, um, what would you have done on your campaign without TFC? What would it have looked like? Yeah, we wouldn't just wouldn't have done it. Um, <laughs> we wouldn't have updated the website because uh, we just wouldn't have the bandwidth. Uh, we don't have the resources. I got to save money for kind of uh, TV or digital or so we, we just wouldn't have done it. Um, and then, you know, our on the fundraising side and on the email side, uh, it just would have been more kind of ad hoc, haphazard. Um, and we would have done that because we have to, but um, it would have definitely been more, um, less, less impactful. And so, I mean, it really is, I mean, it really is like, we really are just such a small shop compared to a congressional race or a Senate race. There's just, we have to have, we have to depend on outside people. Um, you know, <laughs> we, we're, we are, or we're three staffers um, or two staffers, one who, helps me because he's my friend so three um and we have to raise a million dollars we raised a million over a million dollars and we had to knock on a lot of doors and that very quickly takes all the bandwidth of the people you do have and so um yeah no we couldn't we couldn't have we couldn't we, we depend on y'all amazing always good to hear um <laughs> Uh, I think I saw someone's hand raised. I want to make sure if someone had a question that I got to them. Was there someone? Maybe. Okay, I guess not. Um, yeah, if anyone has a question. Um, oh, wait, there is a question in the chat that I missed. Um, what do you think the Republicans' candidates did right during this year's election? So... <laughs> So um, I kind of have like two minds about this. On the one hand, I'm a complete nihilist and I think nothing matters. Um, and I think it's just like all negative partisanship all the way down. Um, and, I, and I think like that's not just now, but it's like historical. Um, you know, Lyndon Johnson and Democrats pass the Great Society and then lose however many seats. FDR passes the New Deal and loses X amount of seats. Um, you know, Obama passed, uh, they passed the ACA, lose a ton of seats, then Trump passes the tax plan, lose a bunch of seats. I, I just think like in some ways, like structurally, there's that swing back um, that, you know, we build a firewall so, so that people like me still win. Um, and that firewall is just resources, goodwill, hard work, been around. Um, on the other hand, like what did they do well? You know, it's interesting because if you look at what actually happened in Virginia, the places we lost were places with, that had rural parts of their district, right? So the seven seats we lost, um, I think five of them had substantial rural population and then two were just Virginia Beach, right? And Virginia Beach definitely of the cities and suburbs was an outlier in how much it moved towards the Republicans, um, which isn't necessarily all that surprising if you know Virginia Beach. Um, but the other five had pretty heavy rural um, turnout and, and we just, got kept crushed in the rural areas in ways, um, right? The, the turnout there was really high and rural areas continue to move against us. And if you look at someone like La Charisse Aird's district, turnout was down just enough in Petersburg to not overcome the rural area. Um, you know, Josh Cole in Stafford County, a similar thing. Uh, Martha Mugler, Pocosin turnout, very conservative area, just high enough to swamp the other parts of her district. And so I, I think a lot of their messaging and just the negative partisanship really kind of brought people up in, in the rural areas. And I, don't, I, I think a lot of their candidates were able to, to ride that wave, but, but you know, some of their messaging gin, gin that up too. Um, and so I, 
I don't, I don't know how much credit I give them if I'm being honest. Uh, I mean, I think Glenn Youngkin himself ran a pretty good campaign in hindsight um, that helped a lot of their candidates. I mean, he he was able to kind of play the middle ground and I blame our candidate for allowing him to do that, uh, McAuliffe. Uh, but he was able to play a middle ground to the masses and then he was able to do a right-wing message to his base separately. And, um, and in a year where structurally things were against us because of Democrats in the White House, Democrats in the State House, um, I think that helped them a lot. Yeah, that makes sense. And it looks like we have one last question here from Sam. I don't. Just read it. I'll, I'll read it. Any, yeah, any gifts for getting your engaged right. supporters to go beyond their own vote to take active steps to boost turnout amongst their less engaged supporters? <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't know. It's it's right, it's like really easy to do that when um, people are motivated. So 17 and 19 are certainly years where in Virginia people were very motivated to do that for Democrats. And it speaks to the negative partisanship as much as it does about how much people liked me or Ralph Northam. Um, you know, I mean, I, it's insane how many doors we knocked in 2017. I mean, it's like, it's like crazy. And then they did it again in 2018 for Abigail Spanberger, who's my congresswoman. Um, and it's in a year like this where it's really, really hard to do that. And, and I don't know that there's a good answer to that, if I'm being honest, because, uh, you know, in Henrico County, Western Henrico County, where I live, I mean, since 2017, uh, people have been giving a lot of their time up to knock doors for me or to Abigail, then me again, and then Abigail again. Uh, and there's a certain amount of like, just like the psychology of it all, like you can understand why they just are less likely to do that once Democrats are in power. I don't blame them for that. Um, but I mean, I think the way that you mitigate against that is you just have to, you have to build a good organization, um, which I think we've done a pretty good job of here in Henrico between myself, Abigail, Rodney Willett, who's the delegate next to me, Deborah Rodman, who was delegate and ran for Senate in 19. Um, and the, the kind of as well as the Eastern Henrico candidates and, and, and local elected officials. I think we've done a good job at building a, a network that comes out and, and helps. So I think we were able to mitigate it here more than in other areas, but I, I don't, I just, don't, it's, it's really hard to have a good answer to that because it, it depends on the macro, but then it also depends on the micro and the candidate. And every year you're an incumbent, it gets harder to motivate people to do that because they think you're safe, you're not fresh anymore. Um, you know, there's other challenges. And on the one hand, that's totally understandable. Um, and on the other hand, when you're in a seat like mine, you're kind of like, eh, we're not as safe as you think we are. Please come back. Um, so I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm rambling now, but I mean, I think the, the only answer to that is like, you have got to build a network and this goes back to being the people thing, right? You've got to have built a network of goodwill where people are like, oh, okay, we're tired, but we'll do a little bit for Skylar or we'll do a little bit for Rodney. Um, and I think we've been able to do a pretty good job of that here, um, which is one reason why uh, Henrico, our area, um, was really kind of an outlier at the state level. Um, Rodney won by more than he won by 19, was one of only four candidates that did that. And then I basically had the same. Um, and so, you know, I think I, I think we've been able to build something nice here. And I mean, some of it's Henrico's changing too. It's not just us, but yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming tonight and answering questions and letting us work with you. Um, it's been amazing. Uh, and I'll hand it off to Amanda. Thank you guys. Cheers. Um, yeah, cheers. And, uh, and uh, we might have to do this again next year and the year after that. So if we do, I'm, I might look a, light, a lot more depressed um, and sad. <laughs> and, but you'll call us. <laughs> yeah, please God, no. But uh, we might have a couple more elections in, in Virginia because of this redistricting delay. So, but well, thank right. you for everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'll see about that. And thank you for everything. Um, well, so I would like to go ahead and we have three really all star volunteers who were involved in this last uh, cycle. And so I wanted to. Um, their names are Nisha 
Stanley and Laura, and I wanted to kick it off by first letting them introduce themselves. So yeah, Laura, why don't we start with you? Hi, I'm Laura Oppenheimer. Um, I am joining from San Francisco, California today, um, and I work for Quizlet, and I think Christy, who works for Quizlet, is also on the call tonight. So we have double Quizlet representation, which is super exciting. And uh, this cycle, I worked for uh, Finale Johnson Norton's campaign in the Virginia 100th, um, and it is the third TFC project I worked on. I also worked in 2020 on um, Joe Drago's website in Texas and then Natasha Market's email campaign in North Carolina. So I've been all around the country, um, but this is my yes. first time doing a, uh, a lead pro leading a project. So excited to be here. Yeah, thank you for attending. And Stanley, what about you? Sorry, I had to find the um, unmute button. Can everyone hear me all right? Yep, we can. Okay, hi. Uh, so I am a business analyst at Hartford Hospital. Um, and my expertise is really in data science and data analytics. I'm originally from Palo Alto, uh, but I've been in New England for like the past five years now. Um, nine, if you count the four years I spent in college. Um, yeah, and I was the data, I was the email data analyst for Skylar Van Valkenburg's campaign, um, which I believe you're all acquainted with. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your work on that campaign and great to meet you. Um, Nisha, let's hear from you. Hi, everyone. Um, I am joining from San Francisco as well. I am actually doing the startup thing right now. I'm co-founding a skincare company for skin of color. Um, so for people with darker skin tones, my background's actually in finance and operations. Um, but as many of you, if anyone who's ever done a startup knows, you kind of do a little bit of everything. So, so now I do a little bit of everything. Um, I'm originally from upstate New York, um, but I've been in SF now for six years. And I was the email team lead, um, for Delegate Kelly Fowler's re-election campaign. Um, so yeah, and first time doing TFC actually. So it was it was an awesome experience and crazy campaign to work on for the first time. <laughs> well, welcome and we're so grateful to have you. Um, well, yeah, thank you all for introducing yourselves. Next, I would love to go back a little bit and ask you all, what made you decide to pull the trigger and sign up to volunteer with TFC in the first place? I yeah, can Laura, start. start. We just go in, in this order again. Yeah, so sure. um, uh, way back in 2016, um, you know, it was a pretty tough election year. And, you know, I grew up in the Bay Area, California, and I essentially have only ever lived in like cities on coasts and I'll count maybe, I don't know if Chicago counts as a city on a coast, but it's, it's the coast of Lake Michigan. So, um, and, you know, it was pretty defeated after 2016, um, just given sort of what I thought might be possible and how things turned out. Um, and, and a couple of things happened then. Um, one, just like realized I had to like stop spending my time in the echo chamber of Facebook, um, which is like Facebook plus living in San Francisco is like a double echo chamber. Um, yeah. And that was like really good for my mental health as well. Um, and then, you know, wanted to think about how I could be helpful for progressive causes outside of San Francisco where like, you know, when you vote here, you're voting for like the green party candidate versus the socialist versus like the Democrat to represent you. Um, and so TFC had been on my radar um, earlier and I don't remember how, but ended up uh, just deciding to volunteer and, and realizing like I could make time to do this. It wasn't a huge commitment um, given that it was, you know, five to seven hours a week um, just for a short period of time. And that's how I got involved. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. And I'm so glad that you found us. Um, Stan, Stanley, let's hear from you next. Sure. Um, I've always been interested in politics, but up until this point, I had mostly just been involved in, well, I hadn't been involved. I was just reading it. I just, but I really like politics. I, I like reading about it and thinking about it. 
And um, so for years, I'd always just sort of been kicking it, kicking the can down the road. And I guess between the 2016 election and sort of the shock that that sort of impacted um, and, and just sort of the unique situation I was, I had just finished grad school but I didn't have a job yet at the time. So I was like, well, I have all these skills and this is a chance to do something that I'm actually interested in and I really want to help out with. And, you know, I've got all this time. So what the heck, what do I have to lose at this point? And so that's kind of how I got involved and uh, yeah. look back. Yeah, totally. I think 2016 was a big motivator for a lot of us. <laughs> um, thank you for sharing. Nisha, what about you? Yeah, for sure. I have to echo so many of the things um, that you all just heard. I, I TFC was actually on my radar for a while too. And I think what I've always felt is that like every time I kind of see these super narrow um, margin campaigns, I always think to myself, like tech and marketing folks are the people who really have the best ability to make a political difference, just given what we do every day. Um, okay. But at the same time, you know, working full-time for a campaign is not necessarily feasible for everyone. Obviously the tech industry pays us a lot better than a lot of campaigns would. And so it makes it really difficult for campaigns to recruit the strong talent um, that I wish they could. And so for me, it really came down to that. And I finally um, just said to myself, I have the time. Yes, I'm starting a company, but at the same time, if there's any time that I have the most flexibility and I'm making my own schedule, this is it. And so actually it kind of coincided with founding for me where I just said, I'm, I'm like making time for the things that I want to make time for. And this is one of those things. Um, so I just pulled the trigger <laughs> on it finally this year. Well, that's so awesome. And, and I'm just really grateful that you have prioritized TFC while you have so much impressive and crazy stuff going on in your life. So thank you for that. Um, yeah. And thank all of you for sharing. So my last question is kind of a loaded one. I would love to hear from each of you on what was your big biggest surprise when you came onto CFC um, about you know the work and and what you ended up doing and um, and then also what was your biggest learning. And yeah, I think we can just go in the same order. Laura, I'd love to hear from you. Um. I will say probably my biggest surprise actually came from working on Natasha Marcus's uh, campaign, which was, I was just shocked at how bad the tools were. Um, and I've worked with like a lot of different email marketing tech and just like, I think we were on NGP seven, the old one. Mm -hmm. And it was like, it was like worse than what I had used, you know, like 15 years ago. Um, like constant contact from 2006 was better than this product. Um, mm -hmm. And I was just shocked that like candidates were like fighting through this like buggy bad tech to make things happen. And I will say NGP8 seems to be like much, much better, but like this is just normal, right? And so I think like having folks um, who at least are like digital sort of di slightly more digitally savvy, I think helps. Um, given that like the candidates themselves aren't email marketers and especially on some of these like smaller races, like they don't know how to do it. Um, and what is a, a big learning? I mean, I think just like how, how personal these smaller like elections are, how tight the margins are um, mm -hmm. and how much, you know, our efforts, even like a few hours a week can make a huge difference for them, so. Yeah, totally. Stanley, what about you? Oh, I think you're muted. Sorry about that. I no worries. Um, I, I would have to second Lauren. Laura, Laura, sorry. Um, it, the big shock was how we were basically using two platforms to tracker email. So we were using NGP7 to send out the emails. And then as a result, we were getting all the all the metrics like, you know, how many people open these emails and how many clicks it got and how many unsubscribes or bounces. But on the other hand, donations were being processed by Act Blue. So the, the biggest learning we had to do on the fly was, well, how do we marry these two different data sets together, even though they're different ID schemes? 
And so a lot of that was just um, like scraping together just ad hoc code to, to process that data and clean it up and marry it together. Um, it was pretty much held together with like paper clips and bailing wire, but um, I managed to yep. make it work. And yep. um, what was the second part of the question again? What was your biggest learning? Like, what did you learn for yourself biggest personally? Um, personally, I guess with something like this, you have to be always experimenting. Like as a data analyst, it's like, uh, you know, the first part, most of the, most of the hours they spent was just trying to get things um, organized and clean because that was sort of what it, my primary duty was as a data analyst. But after that, it was just trying to do different sort of data analytics to see if like something would shake out um you know and experimenting and and to be fair a lot of that didn't go anywhere um but every now and then you know i would I'd find something i would show some of the rest of the team and they're like oh that's interesting yeah we should look into that um so it's like always be pushing always be experimenting you know should you need to always be asking yourself like what can i do um you know what more can i do what how can i make this better um you know what can i do to just squeeze a little bit more value out of this thing um, so I, I think that would be the, that's the most valuable thing I learned from this campaign, you know, always be, always be experimenting, always be pushing and, you know, don't let the setbacks get you down. Just keep trying. Yeah, totally. Well, I'm glad. All right, Nisha. Um, yeah, I mean, because this was my first campaign, honestly, I think the biggest surprise was election day and just how close the campaign ended up being at the end of the day. It is always um, so close. Yeah. So crazy. And I think what was so kind of odd also coming from the tech industry I think we we oftentimes use like data and signals to just assume what's going to happen at the end of the day and what was so strange with Kelly's campaign is that all the data was kind of pointing to a pretty solid win for her throughout like we had raised we had raised more money throughout we had raised more money from individual donors throughout and small gifts um she was running for re-election she had had you know two um successful terms already and so I think what was so wild is that even after all of those data points were pointing in the right direction she ended up only winning by 344 votes was just so insane to me um and I think it was just so nuts also to just think about like I know 344 eligible voters like in my own network like that's how Isn't small like crazy yeah so nuts um but it also showed that I think every little thing that we did mattered and so I think like on the flip side it was so awesome to just see the hard work um pay off even though it was extremely uh nerve-wracking <laughs> nail fighting yeah. that night of yeah. election her her campaign actually didn't even get called for an entire week after election yeah yeah, yeah. It, was, it was crazy um awesome. but I think other learnings I think some of the kind of really positive learnings were um that I had assumed also that if people had donated in the past that they might not necessarily donate again. Um, and we actually found the opposite with Kelly's campaign. So that was really cool just seeing that people were sort of more willing to double down when they had already put their money where their mouth was. Um, and they were sort of the most reliable, you know, fundraisers um, throughout, which was really cool. Um, and the last thing is just that everybody, like, especially with email marketing, they just wanted to kind of be heard and appreciated. And when we sent out the simplest of emails that was just like, thank you for donating last month, you know, <laughs> with like no agenda and nothing else to it. That some of those were the biggest money makers. Cause I think people yeah. just like, thank you for thanking me. Um, and so, yeah, so that was really nice to see too, is that people really just, they, they wanted to feel like they were being heard. Yeah. It is definitely an important thing not to forget to just say thank you for sure. Can I add well, one more learning really quickly? Yes. This is not, not a plant uh, comment, but I was also going to say, I was surprised personally at just like how I was able to carve out the time to do this. Um, and like, I work for a company, shameless plug for quiz that gives us like 40 hours a week to volunteer. Um, so like there was a couple of times when I was like, oh, I'm just going to take like a couple hours and like log that officially. But also it was just like, hey, this is actually like a half hour less of like Shit's Creek that I'm watching tonight, or I'm like doing something in front of the TV. And I like, I can't leave my house anyways, because it's a global pandemic. So like, you know, it just was like five to seven hours a week. It's like, Ooh, that sounds like a lot. But then it was like, actually, this can just kind of like fit into my digital day in a way that like, wasn't too hard of a flex. And so um, that that was a great learning too. And it sort of gave me the confidence to continue signing up for things. So 
Well, that's great. Yeah. The, the best kind of screen time there could possibly be. I, I certainly have to agree with that. Well, thank you all so much for, for tuning in and for, um, and for chatting with us. We really appreciate you coming and also obviously for all of your volunteer work this cycle and before. So with that, I will turn it over to Greg to talk about our 2022 plans. All right. Thank you. And thank you everybody uh, for, for volunteering again. And it's, I, I haven't watched it creek, but I'm sure it can, it can stand to be. It's a really uh, good show. I, I know. Um, okay. So for our uh, kind of, as we take 2021 into account and in 2022, um, we need to have an enthusiasm year. And that's, 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 basically it. Uh, Republicans, as Skylar mentioned, that have clear, um, unalienable and strong enthusiasm. And as we look around the country, the sort of consequences for not matching that are pretty stark, whether it's like regressive legislation, uh, literal voter suppression that's happening in like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, like right now, uh, which ultimately culminates in like threats to election administration in 24 and, and um, you know, not really hyperbole to say our democracy itself. Um, and so what we're dealing with now is, you know, the org started in that same post-2016 period, as a lot of folks mentioned, where uh, Democrats are really behind on, on digital. And um, thankfully, that's changed. People aren't saying, oh, I don't need to, I can ignore that now. I, I don't need to be on Facebook. I don't you know, need to do that. But what's what's really um, missing as the, the world's evolved is being good at it. You know, like you can be there and that's, it's good to be there. You need to be there and you can still spend more money um, in many, many places than we are now, but we need to be good at it now. And that's a different, that's a different problem. So um, creating guidance, making it easy to act upon, you know, we plan to work with um, hundreds of campaigns next year or 20 this year, it needs to be easy to act upon as many of the volunteers uh, here know. Um, and a lot of that data infrastructure really helped our teams um, do it or at least see how they're doing. Yeah, uh, investing in rural areas, those infrequent voters um, that Skylar mentioned, they came out to defeat Trump, but they're not necessarily sold on the Democratic Party brand entirely. And, and when you go down ballot, you just often just don't know uh, who folks are and what they do. So for us, legislative contests remain sort of an outsized opportunity for impact. Uh, those narrow, narrow margins really um, make programs like ours uh, sing, and, and it's where we can make an impact. So our 2022 strategy is really helping Democrats be, de be better at the internet, uh, especially state Democrats. So it kind of comes into three um, buckets. What is direct state support? So the stuff that we've been talking about, uh, delivering really high quality websites, emails, um, digital ads, and text message campaigns at very low cost of campaigns and at scale. The second is um, our experimentation and voting by mail program. It's an independent expenditure that we've really learned that to be able to push the envelope like we were trying to do, like we were doing in New Jersey, we really have to run our own programs along with helping candidates um, do them. And third is uh, our learning engine, which is our uh, sort of culture and technology that helps um, us test, measure, and scale uh, learning. So when we learn some learn best practice on digital, we can push it out uh, to campaigns and ultimately help folks do a better job of communicating their message. So um, that's really the underpinning of, of everything we're, we're going to be doing. It's really great to build a website or set, raise money or, or, or win a certain election. But the way we all have 10 year plus impact is by building um, leverage into what we're doing, or leverage into what we're doing um, and uh, continue to do this in a systematic uh, fashion. So in 2022, we have uh, a lot of strong, fun conversations we're having with competitive chambers uh, this year. Um, folks like in, in Michigan, Pennsylvania, maybe Virginia, we'll see, um, Minnesota. In other states, we're seeing the effects of partisan gerrymandering. So Florida, Texas, and North Carolina come to mind as some areas where partisan gerrymandering process have really um, squeezed the map together with that GOP enthusiasm uh, to make fewer opportunities out there. But it is important, it's incredibly crucial to not forget and to not forego investment in those areas. Uh, a lot of things that have gotten Democrats into trouble over the last 20 years are sort of giving up and giving um, and, uh, you know, forgoing any investment um, in, in many areas. So we're talking to folks in Montana, Kentucky, Kansas, about ways that we can um, help from a scaled perspective. We expect to, um, to be able to pick up on this experimentation work into the new year. 
Uh, broadly, voting rules are becoming more confusing, harder, and at a time where reaching voters is becoming trickier, whether it's um, changing habits, I was 14, messing with targeting, uh, there's a lot of different things, but we're really focused on pushing the envelope forward in how digital can reach uh, traditional um, constituencies of the Democratic Party that are, are uh, you know, basically under reach. And that means younger folks, uh, people of color who um, aren't as easy to, to get to by, you know, sort of the traditional methods of, uh, you know, calling landlines. So um, we spent a lot of time this year uh, investing in data infrastructure for our learning engine. And uh, happy to say that feature delivery is now picking up quite a bit after doing a lot of that work. Um, so, uh, you know, whether it's competitive leaderboards, these project health dashboards, or we're enabling our staff and volunteers to know if they're, you know, hitting the right cadence, if they're talking about the right things. Um, cross campaign A B testing, we're planning a new training program in uh, January and looking at different ways to make uh, our best practices and, and learnings as available by many, as many campaigns as possible. Um, in the new year, and we're super excited about that for both uh, our volunteers and the direct programs that we're able to run, but also campaigns um, and organizations beyond that. We have on December 8th a virtual fundraiser that I would love everybody to sign up for. Um, it is a, on an unfortunate topic, I will admit, but I think a really interesting and important one. So we'll be joined by Dr. David Eisenberg, who is the former medical director of Planned Parenthood St. Louis, the last remaining abortion clinic in Missouri after uh, the state government um, basically forced uh, every other option for care shut down. Uh, Michigan State Representative Murray Minugian, who's a rising star, active in the fight, and Jessica Alter, our co-founder and chair. So um, there's a link, you can't click it because it's a Zoom, but it's on our website in the events tab and we can put the link in the chat. So um, bring it all together. We're uh, active talking to folks now. We really expect to start um, scaling up a lot of projects. So if you are uh, out there looking for work, <laughs> it'll, it'll come very soon. Um, a lot of the messaging work, a lot of the uh, ad experimentation work will be happening throughout the year. And um, same with the, the uh, uh, learning engine um, stuff. So very excited about the impact we can make uh, this year and you know, really realistically for a five, 10 year period after that, um, because you know, we didn't get in this hole in the states. We didn't get to having 60% of state legislatures controlled by Republicans overnight, and it'll take quite a while uh, to dig out, but I'm excited to you know, be there in the fight. So um, whether you uh, are a volunteer, a donor, or both, uh, we encourage you to get involved. Um, and can I don't I haven't looked at the Zoom chat, but if there's any questions, happy to happy to answer any. There is a TikTok campaign guidance. I'm too old for that, but if you know what to do, <laughs> we can make it happen. Uh, there was one question earlier. Um, should Democrats focus, uh, pivot to focus heavily on everything positive Democrats are doing across the country and very little on Trump? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Um, I think one of the things that we saw as we've uh, looked at different messages is that when you stick to kitchen table things about the economy, about making like in Virginia, they cap the price of insulin, um, you know, working on the high, sort of notoriously high, high traffic uh, highways, um, folks really respond to that message. It's sort of understandable, especially at the state legislative level where often the biggest problem is that people just don't know what, what's going on and what's, what's happened and how things have affected their lives. Um, and at the moment, Trump isn't really affecting anybody's life right that much. Uh, he's probably going to be back. Uh, I imagine in 2022, he probably won't be able to resist going out and, um, you know, showing his face and getting credit for campaigning for Republicans. Um, but, uh, you know, and like that'll work, I think, for, for some section of the base. But one of the really important things is to just not rely on that. You do need to pot paint a positive story about how policies, um, both of the state, uh, local, state, and federal level, um, positively affect folks' lives. And, um, you know, the other thing we've learned is really that as these Republican sort of misinformation driven attacks come out and hit candidates, it is really important to pay attention to the words we use and how we um, rebut those attacks to, you know, essentially not, not feed the, uh, the fever dream. So um, there's a lot of really important things around messaging that uh, we're excited to tackle. And that's kind of as we think of uh, our big challenge for the upcoming year um, and beyond is, is helping so many campaigns that uh, don't have resources do a better job at messaging um, and getting their voices heard. 
Uh, the vote by mail efforts, Robert asking, uh, was a program that we ran last year and plan to run next, or, yeah, next year. Um, still, still 2021, uh, where we use digital marketing. So uh, Facebook, Snapchat, Reddit ads, um, email, text messages to get folks to vote by mail, um, especially as sort of COVID hit and, and folks, uh, you know, needed that type of assistance. So voting hasn't gotten easier. <laughs> it's gotten harder. Um, and so we think there's a uh, room appetite and, and a need for a program like that. Uh, we concluded in a post-election analysis that we helped um, increase turnout of folks by almost eight and a half percentage points, which is quite a lot in a, in a especially in a presidential year. Um, and uh, so we're excited to, to do that again. Sam, with the Snapchat as a center, yeah, it's a cool feature. Um, do you see a trend emerging of non-Facebook social networks to do more to position themselves as a pro-democracy? I don't know. We'll see. That's my honest answer. Any last questions, Amanda, Lauren, folks want to chime in or anything? I am not seeing any other ones, but... We've got a lot of good ones so far. So thank you all for your questions. Yeah. Oh, there's a, there's a quick one. Um, do we help nonpartisan candidates? Uh, no, we're actually a fully partisan organization, uh, both in spirit and legally. Uh, so if you are a nonprofit, like a 501c3, uh, is actually, you know, we're not really effectively allowed to, to work with them. So with that, uh, we will wrap it up. Thank you for uh, joining tonight um, and very excited to see you all back uh, in in the first quarter. Um, and we, if you're a volunteer looking for a project, pay attention to your inbox, uh, check the promotions folder. Um, Gmail's, Gmail's, uh, Gmail's filters have foiled many uh, attempt at um, civic good. Uh, so check out the promotions folder, spam folder, et cetera, uh, for our recruitment requests and have a great night. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.